Hello everyone, I'm Jordana Van of Raven Light Holistic Healing and welcome to Honey Badger as a totem. Now I have two Honey Badger videos, Honey Badger as a totem and Honey Badger as a spirit guide. This here is the video that you want if you've always been drawn to Honey Badgers or have had a lot of experiences with them, in which case, dude, you probably have some stories to tell. If Honey Badgers are just suddenly showing up everywhere but you've never really had any abiding interest in them, then it's more likely that it's a spirit guide, which is a temporary messenger here to help you with a specific issue rather than a lifelong teacher. In that case, you'll want to watch my video, Honey Badger as a Spirit Guide, what it means when you're seeing honey badgers everywhere, which will be out soon if it isn't already. And remember, there is a complete alphabetized library of all my videos on my website, www.ravenlightholistichealing.com, making it easy to see if I've made the video of greatest interest to you. Want a chance at having me make a video about your totem or spirit guide? Consider becoming a channel member. Second and third tier channel members get to make video requests. And third tier members get to vote on which one becomes the next video. To learn about channel membership, just click join next to the subscribe button. If you can't see the join button, which can happen for any number of reasons, I provide super easy directions on my website for how to make the join button visible. Just go to the video description here on YouTube and the link to my site will be right there at the top. So let's start with the rather oxymoronic nature of the honey badger's name. Here we have a critter called the quote, meanest animal on the planet, where one half of its name signifies aggressive nagging, while the other half is one of our primary sources of sweetness. While there are a lot of ways in which we could interpret this, what we're primarily looking at here is an animal for whom sweetness in life is found in behaving in ways that other people find offensive or upsetting. Now, this isn't because honey badgers are looking to fight with you. Though they are often referred to as the little warrior, battle itself isn't what enlivens them. Rather, honey badger people are fulfilled by situations of raw, unfiltered authenticity, by unapologetically doing what they want and saying what they think because that is what they want to do, not because of how you might react. They'll clap back with everything that they've got if you try to tell them that they should do or be something else. But again, it's not because they enjoy the conflict itself in most cases, nor do they even really feel a need to prove a point. It's the simple being of themselves in which the honey of life is found. And despite all of our modern day new agey hype about authenticity, expressing the true unfiltered self is the last thing that pop culture actually embraces. Oh, we want you to be the real you, as long as the real you is absolutely, perfectly, eternally, unstintingly kind, loving, fair, inclusive, and supportive of the prevailing belief system. Express certain doubts or experience of human moment, moment of judgmental behavior and you could be canceled faster than you can sneeze. Honey badgers, if they were said to wage a war against anything, would be warriors against cancel culture. Though even here, their behavior wouldn't be a statement against existing norms. It would simply be them being them. This is very much a manifestation of numerological one energy. In its purest incarnation, one is unashamedly self-focused. It is here simply to be itself for itself, to blaze its own unique trail, and it doesn't care one bit if anyone else follows. It does care, however, if you stand in its way. Then it will fight you tooth and nail, even to the death if it comes to that. We can also bring Sagittarius to the party here. My mother, who has studied astrology for most of her life, refers to Sagittarians as lethally blunt. And I cannot think of a better description of unfiltered Sag energy. A Sag's comments can cut to and through the bone. It's not that Sag wants to hurt you, not at all. It's just being real. This comes more naturally to Sagittarius than others. And even once it's learned it's hurt your tender widow feelings, it doesn't particularly care. It doesn't need you to like it. 
or to approve of it because it knows that it's right and it doesn't require your input to feel good about itself. So with this in mind, and we'll explore this in other places in the video as well, if you're someone who really identifies with Honey Badger, it's a good bet that you've got some strong Sagittarian influence somewhere in your astrological chart. And remember, guys, your chart is so, so much more complicated than your sun sign. You don't have to have a Sagittarius sun to have some serious Sagittarian qualities. There's also likely to be some Scorpio somewhere in your chart, particularly if it occurs through a stellium, three or more planets, in your eighth house. We'll talk more about Scorpio in a bit. Numerologically, you're more likely to have a one life path, destiny number, or soul urge number, or to be born on the 1st, 10th, 19th, or 28th day of the month. So, if Honey Badger is your totem, at least part of your life will involve learning how to be scathingly unfiltered. You aren't here to be kind. You're here to be painfully real and to trigger people with your realness. People do need to be triggered. Our triggers are symptoms of unhealed wounds and beliefs about inherent powerlessness that need to be faced and resolved. And while ultimately your behavior as a honey badger person does provide a much needed service to the world, the fact that you're helping others is incidental. You're not here to serve anyone but yourself. Now, at least a handful of you just flinched and thought, no, that's wrong. We're not supposed to be selfish. I know, guys, I know. If you've been raised to believe that you can only be a good person if you live in a consistent state of sacrifice, this seems like an express ticket to hell. But some of us are here to focus all and only on ourselves. That is what is good for us and for divine order. And Honey Badger is one of those. Serving the self is, in the right context, every bit as holy and vital as serving the world. So, as young children, honey badger people don't usually show signs of becoming the kind of people who would make a habit of merrily destroying other people's egos, nor of the fierce independence that will later be among their hallmarks. In fact, you might have been sheltered to an unusual degree, very likely homeschooled, in fact, and a true innocent in every sense of the word. Honey badgers are born blind and hairless and utterly vulnerable. For the first three months after their birth, they don't even leave their burrows as they lack the ability to defend themselves or feed themselves and are therefore totally dependent upon mom to return and nurse them. Even after leaving the burrow, they stay with their mothers for 14 months or more, an unusually long span in the animal kingdom. Compare this to the American badger and the European badger, each of whose cubs are all set to leave mom after approximately four to six months. If you're a honey badger person, it's likely that you either lived with your folks long after most of your friends had left the nest, or if you're still a young person, that you still live with your folks. And while, as an adult, there will be few others that you can truly respect, if any at all, you'll tend to admire your mother, who would have been a source of strength and a role model for independence, determination, and a no-nonsense attitude. She might still drive you nuts. Even the best mamas can make us crazy sometimes. But you'll usually still consider her among your role models. The reason honey badgers stay with mom for so long is that effective hunting, which includes digging and climbing, require a degree of coordination and the use of techniques that juveniles lack until at least eight months of age. Two, learning exactly how to catch rodents, even when they bolt into tunnels or escape holes, and killing venomous snakes are skills that take a lot of time to learn. It is for this reason that honey badger people tend to live at home for a bit longer than most others, or if they don't live at home, to remain near their folks and rely on them extensively. They aren't lazy. They just need a little extra guidance on what adulting actually entails and how to do it, and they need to experience being challenged and learning how to hold their own. So if you feel like you're off to a slow start, honey badger people, don't beat yourself up. When you consider the demands of being a truly independent, authentic individual in this world, which is what you came here to do, you'll understand why it's taken you some extra time to be ready to fly on your own. 
Now, once you're out of the house and taking care of yourself, you are independence incarnate. Adult honey badger folks don't need anyone. And they will tend to get seriously irritated with anyone who seems to need them, children notwithstanding. Clingy people need not apply. This is because honey badgers are loners. While groups of two or three are often sighted, this is most often a mother with her cubs. Male honey badger adults grow to be a third larger than females and are often larger than mom before they leave to go off on their own. So seeing them, people often assume it's a group of adults. On occasion, small groups of males might be found together, but this is usually because they've all wound up congregating at the same food source or are after the same female. So these folks aren't really seeking close relationships with others. Honey badger people may still have a small group of friends, but while they probably share some common surface interests, these friends don't know them deep down. And honey badger people prefer it that way. They are genuinely happiest in their own company, though they're not homebodies. You know those adorable introvert memes where the person revels in being by themselves and the self-time is best enjoyed cozied up in their comfy little cabin with a cup of hot chocolate and a book while the rain pours down? Yeah, not a honey badger person. Honey badgers, again, not homebodies. They're not territorial in the typical sense, meaning they don't have one place or space that they consider theirs, defending it fiercely and retreating there when they want to be alone. Multiple badgers share the same enormous territory, moving individually from burrow to burrow each day. And usually the burrow was dug by some other critter first. The dominant badger in the area will constantly roam and scent mark the region, but again, said region is huge and shared with other males and females. There's no real pride of possession here. So these folks are often wanderers, another big Sagittarius quality, Sag being our travel fiend. And they're not generally looking for the perfect someone with whom to settle down. First, because a special someone would likely demand more of their energy than they are interested in giving. And second, because they have zero desire to play house. They are extremely active individuals, constantly needing to be on the move. And this level of restlessness tends to wear other people out. It should go without saying then that honey badgers are also not monogamous. Males and females do not form attachments of any kind. However, male honey badgers will defend a burrow with extreme violence if they've sequestered their mate in there and another badger seems interested. When the male is ready to mate, he barricades a female in his chosen burrow and then doesn't let her out until multiple matings have occurred. Afterwards, the male leaves and the female raises the cubs on her own. Honey badger folks, particularly those who identify as male, are extremely, extremely defensive of those things they want and utterly obsessed with them for as long as it takes for them to learn everything about it or to experience it to the fullest degree possible. And then they lose interest so fast it's as though the thing never existed. This is very much a Scorpio set of pattern with Scorpios being well known for their obsessions. Though in its healthiest incarnation, it would be more accurate for us to reframe these as passions. If they're stalking their ex, it's an obsession. If they're learning everything there is to know about kayaking, it's probably a passion. Whatever the case, if it has uh, captured Scorpio's interest, they are absolutely fixated on it. By extension, you don't want to get between the honey badger person and whatever has snagged their attention. Just as in the one moment obsessed, next totally disinterested pattern, Scorpios are creatures of extremes, and this most definitely extends to their sex lives in which opposing dominance themes, control versus submission, tend to be prevalent. Sometimes this is perfectly healthy. In consenting adults, the desire to be dominated is sometimes perceived as maladjusted, but it's usually far from. If you are so desirable to the other person that they must possess you, it's actually you who ultimately feels like they have the power. 
which is one reason that bondage play is so common. And again, we are talking about consenting adults here, though the goal of this kind of play is always to pretend that actual domination is occurring. This also indicates that you must be hot stuff since someone wants you all to themselves, which makes our egos feel good. Two, the submissive person has unspoken permission to access the wilder parts of themselves and lose control, something Scorpio often desperately craves but fears. When someone else is driving the bus, they made you do it. And so you're less likely to feel guilty for doing things that might be on the naughtier side or even outright taboo. If you are the one doing the dominating, again, provided it is consensual, this can do great things for your sense of strength and potency. You feel sufficiently potent to attain and control a desirable person, and in pretending to submit to you, they are acknowledging your desirability. This is especially satisfying when other people clearly also want that person, and this is also totally healthy. Where honey badger folks need to be a little extra self-aware is when they find themselves repeatedly in situations in which they're either bullying a romantic partner and it's not part of consensual role play, or conversely, they're feeling as though they legitimately don't have control. Neither one of these is in their best interests, and it's important for them to ask themselves some seriously probing questions. If you tend to bully your partners, why? What do you have to prove? And why do you think you have to prove it? Or who in your life made you feel powerless? And so as you're dominating your partner, you're really moving from a place of wanting to wrest control away from the person whom you perceived as controlling you. On the other hand, if you're feeling victimized, were there any red flags that you ignored and why was it that you ignored them? Is your present relationship similar to past relationships in which you felt controlled? And if so, what was the original toxic relationship? What wounds do you still carry from that relationship? Asking these kinds of questions helps us understand where we are hurting and what we really need to heal ourselves so we can make conscious choices that give us what we need with joy, not pain. Now, even when their sexual relationships are perfectly healthy, honey badger people still don't tend to have what our still relatively traditional monogamy promoting society would consider a well-adjusted sex life. Sex is more often about scratching an itch here than emotional intimacy. And it's not uncommon for these guys to have many different partners. If you're watching this video, you probably understand this, but I have worked with countless folks for whom the idea of sleeping with someone with whom they don't have an emotional bond is not only a horrific notion, but an outright impossibility. Honey Badger folks, providing you are taking the appropriate contraceptive and disease prevention precautions and that you feel safe and happy in your sexual experiences, you're doing exactly what's right for you. So let's go back to the Honey Badger's path as a no-nonsense, unfiltered being. These are absolutely not the kind of people whose blunt nature is hidden behind a sweet face. Honey badgers are born with a visible warning system so that the whole animal kingdom knows these are not creatures with whom to mess. Their upper bodies, including the tops of their tails, are white, while their lower bodies are black, similar to the coloration of your standard skunk. This type of pattern is nature's way of saying danger. It's also in the honey badger person wholly indicative of their outlook on life, which is unremittingly black and white. These things are either one way or they are another, and there's no real in-between. Another example of the Scorpio tendency towards extremes and the Sagittarian attachment to and willingness to defend their beliefs. Two, older adult males have an obvious scar area on their backs, which is why they're often referred to as scar backs. Scientists believe that these scars are the result of multiple bite wounds, probably a combination of mating-related battles with other badgers, fights with more aggressive prey animals, and encounters with larger predators such as big cats. From the jump, you can tell that these are critters that aren't going to back down from a fight and more that they're likely to be the victors. By extension, what you see is what you get with honey badger people, and most other people therefore know to leave them alone. However, there are people 
like those squirrels that stop, turn, and dash in front of your car, that are wired or wounded in such a way that they feel compelled to place themselves in danger. And so honey badger folks do sometimes run into random human irritants. A spectacular example of this sort of situation conveniently happened last week when a, shall we kindly say, overexcited fan on an airplane kept poking at the person in front of him whom he'd identified as heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, the guy who bit someone's ear off and now sells uh, marijuana edibles called Mike Bites, the guy with the face tattoo. At one point, Tyson was called the baddest man on the planet, not unlike our honey badger. Now, in the words of UFC commentator Joe Rogan, annoying Mike Tyson is about as dumb as headbutting a beehive. I would agree which the guy who kept taunting him with the clear intention of provoking a response discovered when Tyson finally turned around and started beating on him. Guys, it's Mike Tyson. Unless you have the world's most inflated sense of entitlement, which this fan obviously did, you have to know what's going to happen. Reputation aside, he's a big guy with a face tattoo. If that doesn't say approach with caution, I'm not really sure what does. And Tyson showed a laudable amount of restraint. Reportedly, the fan even threw a water bottle at him before he decided he'd finally had enough and lashed out. Similarly, honey badger people aren't psychotic anger mongers. They don't just go around provoking a fight with every critter they see, but they aren't gonna walk away or suffer in silence if you're foolish enough to keep pestering them. Honey badgers actually make a rattling noise when you annoy them, which is why it's believed that their official name is Rattle, which may be a verbal approximation of that sound. Like some snakes, these guys let you know when they're upset before they tear you to pieces, giving you a chance to think better about bothering them. If you don't take it, well, you probably need the ego bashing you're about to receive. <laughs> Now, even when they aren't lashing out at people foolish enough to pester them, honey badger folks do, as we talked about at the beginning of the video, tend to have the effect of upsetting people. They're honest and blunt and don't care at all about people's feelings or treasured beliefs, and they're not supposed to. And the universe supports them in doing this in a variety of different ways. The first is tied to the honey badger's natural resistance to venom. Venomous snakes, including the usually lethal black mamba, make up at least 25% of a honey badger's diet, and badgers do sometimes get bitten in pursuit of the meal. Scientists have recently determined that honey badgers have evolved a set of genetic mutations that prevent snake venom from binding to the cellular, cellular receptors that would signal their nervous system to shut down. For honey badger people, this means that they naturally shake off even the most malicious comments, stuff that would absolutely cripple a more sensitive soul, you know, your average Cancer or Libra, for example. And then they turn around and bite back with so much ferocity that the person doing the commenting is destroyed instead. The second thing that supports their ability to be such tough, brutally honest beings is that the skin around a honey badger's neck is particularly loose. When a predator picks them up by the scruff, the honey badger can whip its head around and bite the predator in the face. They have very strong teeth and strong jaws to go with them, strong enough to crack a tortoise shell. So this is a nasty surprise for the predator. In part, the neck represents flexibility in seeing all around you, meaning that you see all possibilities, all sides. When you have a stiff neck, sometimes it's because you don't wanna look at something. Mature honey badger people are so confident in their beliefs that minor gray areas don't bother them, which is why they can be so rigidly black and white in their own perceptions. It takes a lot to get a honey badger to start questioning things they firmly believe. But this does not mean they can't clearly spot gray areas in your belief system and exploit them. It's almost as though they are magnetically drawn to whatever makes you the most insecure. When a honey badger person is attacked, they usually retaliate with a truth about their attacker that hits the other person where they are most sensitive. So sensitive, in fact, that the other person may literally be traumatized as a result. 
Honey badgers are also exceptionally muscular, with well-developed necks and shoulders and thick skulls. Most of what goes awry with our bodies is simply a symbolic representation of what is occurring within us on an emotional level. The neck and shoulders are where we most often manifest fears around being attacked. Extreme tension in this area can indicate that we fear what will happen if we fail to please someone or if we make a bad decision and say or do something that causes others to become upset and take it out on us. It's our body's way of pulling in our necks and drawing our shoulders up around our ears, presenting our backs so that our more vulnerable hearts and guts are protected. And here we have the honey badger with that extra meaty neck and shoulder region making it considerably less vulnerable to attack. Honey badger people are meant to get to the point where they simply aren't afraid of how others might respond to them, knowing that they are impervious to most, and we'll talk about that most in a few mo moments, forms of retaliation. And if you aren't there yet, that's okay. Remember, the point of a totem is largely to help us become more like that animal. It doesn't always signify that we started out that way. So some honey badger qualities will already be among those you already possess, while others like this one will often still be in the process of being developed. Also in service of helping the honey badger in their mission to be real is an extra thick skin. Honey badger hides have quite a bit of urban mythology attached to them. There are assertions that they're resistant to bee stings and even tough enough to stop a machete. Some sources even call them bulletproof. There isn't a lot of research on this for obvious reasons, but from what I can tell, only their resistance to porcupine quills and dog bites is well documented enough to actually be called factual. Stories of machetes glancing off their hides are also most likely true as well, but still subject to question. Even so, you've got a critter here that isn't easy to wound or kill. In fact, what frequently comes up in the literature is that the only reliable way to kill a honey badger is to bludgeon it to death by whacking it over the head with a club over and over. So a couple of things here. Honey badgers have a notably thick skull. Now, you guys know how we use the phrase thick-headed? This often signifies somebody of sub-average intelligence, which honey badger people are most certainly not. They are smart cookies. But it can also mean that someone is seriously stubborn. And honey badger people are very stubborn. No amount of attacking their personal confidence, trying to breach that thick skin by going for something that hits them on an emotional level, is going to change their mind. The only thing that has a hope in heck of working is beating them over the head with a blunt logic-based argument because they are at heart exceptionally logical individuals and ultimately do care about the truth. Even so, you're going to have to fight with them on this over and over and over. And rather than them changing their minds, it's more likely that you're going to be ripped apart after the first attempt and never get to try again. It is really better to just let these people believe whatever they want to believe. If those beliefs are intended to change, they'll usually encounter the same critical piece of information over and over while doing their own investigations. They will change, but the reason to do so has to come from in here. The one place where honey badger people are vulnerable. And this is that exception I referenced earlier with regard to their being impervious to attacks, is when they go up against big groups rather than individuals. One thing that drives honey badger people bonkers is the hive mentality. In a hive, there's no place for the individual. One must sacrifice at least some of their desires and rights in service of society as a whole. And those who step out of line are punished. Honey badger people who are such fierce individualists, and resent anything that smacks of sacrifice or conformity, get really, really annoyed by people and systems that espouse this kind of mentality. In this one arena, they do tend to experience a significant degree of glee in starting fights with others and getting them to seriously question the degree to which they have surrendered their vital freedoms. 
honey badgers have a fondness, not for honey, as we once thought, hence their names, but for bee larvae. They are nourished by devouring a hive's next generation, and they tend to destroy the hive itself as they do so. Sometimes the badger wins, and happily full goes on its merry way. Other times it gets caught in an apiary trap and is stung to death by a horde of infuriated bees. Here's a critter whose hide can stop dog bites, porcupine quills, possibly a machete, and which is resistant to the venom of some of the world's deadliest snakes. And yet an excess of bee stings can kill it. What we are talking about here is attacking an individual versus an institution. Honey badger folks are drawn to attack the metaphorical sheep among us, those who mindlessly follow the dictates of authority and or media and go along with the herd. We need people like the honey badger person to make us question ourselves and whether or not the societal equilibrium we are supporting is truly a healthy one. But situational awareness is critical here. The honey badger person will probably be just fine going after an individual or even a handful of people. But if they attempt to publicly bring down a large institution, their comments are likely to be so offensive that they're going to pay dearly for them, even if everything they've said is perfectly true. Ultimately, even a honey badger isn't invulnerable. To be who they are and still survive, they need to pick their battles wisely. So what about the prevailing notion, I had to cover this one, guys, that in a fight, honey badgers always go for another animal's testicles. This is what really began gaining honey badgers widespread attention not too long ago, as it suggested that the animal was, animal was consciously choosing to be a major jerk, and many people found this morbidly hilarious. The truth is, there are scattered, largely suspect, reports of honey badgers going for a larger animal's testicles in situations of confrontation. The first record of this behavior was a circumstantial account from 1947 when a badger castrated an adult buffalo. African tribes have also reported wildebeest, water buck, kudu, zebra, and men castrated by honey badgers, but there's no evidence whatsoever to support this. So is it true? Maybe, maybe not. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. This is because the universe uses familiar symbols to speak to us. And many times that symbolism rests in a story, whether or not it's true. This is one of those cases. Now I'm gonna use an explanation that relies upon traditional male mindsets and behaviors. And I want you guys to be aware that what I'm talking about here is the stereotype and is not a unilateral description of men, males, or appropriate masculine behavior. Also, I'm excluding genetic females because, well, we simply don't have the equipment in question, okay? So, in the past, we considered it both normal and healthy, and in some societies still do, for men who didn't get along to solve their problems through aggressive demonstration or confrontation. This is not to say that women don't sometimes do the same thing, but it's more frequently classified as a male behavior. In the animal world, this is how conflicts over territory or breeding rights are predominantly solved, and the competing parties are primarily male. In the case of both men and animals, one male proves his dominance to the other through some kind of superior physical display or through violence, establishing both the pecking order and what belongs to who, after which everyone, presuming the other party survived, can go their merry way, their place in things having been determined. In the animal world, and in extreme cases in the human world, such as in prison culture, one's life might literally be on the line in these situations. Here, you do whatever you have to do, including hitting below the belt with everything you've got. It's important to understand that in these circumstances, kicking the other guy and the family jewels is perfectly acceptable because it is in service of saving your life and proving to others that you're a badass and should be approached with caution if not avoided altogether. 
If you absolutely want others to avoid messing with you, a reputation for fighting dirty is a good thing to have and generally warrants a grudging sort of respect. In other situations of male competition, however, two men might have a fist fight, beat the heck out of each other, and then they're buddies, the conflict having been best solved by just allowing both parties to vent their anger on each other. Trading blows put them on an even keel. They proved their manliness to each other, got to see what the other was made of, and all was well. One of my favorite movies, The Quiet Man with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara, is a good example. The relationship between the protagonist and his brother-in-law is a contentious one until at last they have a knockdown, drag-out brawl that ranges all over the town, after which all the aggression has been spent, honor has been satisfied, and they become harmonious drinking buddies. In these sorts of fights, what is on the line is not survival, so much as honor, in which case Kicking the other guy in the crotch usually has the effect of diminishing one's reputation rather than enhancing it. It's a cheap shot and not the mark of someone with whom you would want to be friends. So unless your life is on the line you or you absolutely don't give a damn what other people think of you, you don't kick your opponent in the tender bits. Honey badger people, having been bitten or stung so many times over the course of their young lives, may treat even minor altercations as though it's a fight to the death. It could go badly, so they had better put a stop to it as fast as possible, whether or not this is truly warranted. This is how they learn to survive as young people. And so they will do or say whatever is needed to bring you completely down in short order. As a result, people might regard honey badger individuals as maladjusted, or lacking honor, rather than respecting them for their strength. Or they may simply not care about their reputations and just want the thing over with as quickly and permanently as possible because it's annoying them and they don't want to have to summon the patients to deal with it. As we talked about earlier, honey badger people aren't tremendously invested in making friends. Their attitude towards others is generally, leave me alone, let me do my thing, or you're going to regret it. If you're a honey badger person and do want to work on creating friendships, remember, we all have numerous totems, so honey badger's energy isn't the only one running you. It's important to look at how you handle antagonism particularly friendly teasing or minor challenges to your self-esteem, such as the average male pissing contest. You may be overreacting. After all, honey badgers are used to dealing with lions and leopards. If you don't act fast and lethally, you're dead. But not every person who comes along is a lion. However, if you really just want people to leave you alone, there is nothing wrong with going for the proverbial throat or groin. Uh, you weren't put here to be a diplomat. As we talked about earlier, it's not like most people aren't aware of the risk they're taking in provoking you. So, what about the honey badger person on a more personal level? We know they're here to express themselves unapologetically and that doing so will likely offend the heck out of others. And we know they don't really care. They're not even remotely warm and fuzzy. But what else is going on inside them? Honey badgers are reclusive, secretive, and generally solitary animals, which is why there is actually a dearth of reliable information about them. Honey badger people, too, are reclusive, secretive, and solitary. That thick skin will keep a lot of stuff out, but it also keeps secrets in. Going back to our Scorpios, Scorpios are known for being able to suss out everyone else's secrets, especially the deep, dark stuff but they are absolutely impervious to anyone else's attempts to dig into their own inner workings, and God help you if you try. Scorps are famous for stinging first and asking questions later, if at all, for a reason. When we get frustrated with someone asking us questions about something we don't want to talk about, we often tell them to quit digging, and honey badgers are diggers extraordinaire. With their long, strong claws, they can dig a burrow in rock-hard ground in 10 minutes, and most of their prey is captured via digging. 
They also have an excellent sense of smell that detects rodents and other prey even before the animal's den is located. And so one thing that interests the heck out of honey badger folks is digging into people. Smell is the sense most closely linked to gut level intuition. And so they can sense when there's a secret you're hiding or you're in denial about something. And they will then question you relentlessly, badger you, until you cough it up. This is a ton of fun for them. Two, honey badgers have the ability to close their inner ears when they're digging so that dirt doesn't enter their ear canals. So even as you are begging these people to leave you alone, the honey badger person often just doesn't hear it. They are utterly focused on discovering whatever you're hiding and your protests literally fall on deaf ears. There is no hidden, soft, sensitive side in most honey badger people. To their very core, they are self-focused and they aren't going to compromise their needs for the sake of your feelings. They may not even be aware you're having feelings. This is another facet of that obsessiveness or single-minded passion we talked about earlier. Honey badger folks also like to dig into life's mysteries. This is really, really what turns them on. Their minds are eternally on, striving to figure something out to go deeper and deeper until they either find what they want or hit a wall. Nothing on the surface interests them. True joys have to be excavated. Going back to Sagittarius, we astrologers say that Sag has three aspects, the gypsy, the philosopher, and the student. The relevant part of the gypsy aspect we already covered when we talked about honey badger people as chronically active wanderers, and it is in their fascination with the big mysteries that the philosopher aspect is highlighted. The philosopher is always asking questions in an attempt to determine the true nature of existence. They don't make mysteries bigger than that. Two, these are seriously smart people. Honey badgers have big brains for their body size and have been observed using tools, one of only a handful of non-primate species to do so. And so honey badger people too are clever, creative thinkers. They can look at something others have analyzed and discover something new. They also need to be constantly stimulated on a mental level. If they don't have something to investigate, they're not happy. This is the student aspect of Sagittarius, which must always be learning. It's important to keep in mind here that all the learning they're doing is ultimately for themselves. These aren't people who learn for the sake of sharing. Once they've learned everything there is about a topic, they lose interest and move on to the next thing. So I hope this has given you guys a good idea of what it means to be a honey badger person. And don't forget to look for honey badger as a spirit guide coming soon. And remember, if you'd like a chance at having me make a set of animal totem and spirit guide videos about your animal, become a channel member at the second and third tier by clicking the join button or click the link in the video description if you can't see the join button and your request might be the one I do next. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Cheers.